Here's our environmental analyst, Roger Harabin. The oil industry has a bad safety record in northern waters. In 1989, the tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground in Alaska, spilling hundreds of thousands of barrels of crude oil, polluting 1,300 miles of coastline. Some of it is still there. Then in 2014, Shell's drilling rig, the Cullock, also ran aground. The firm subsequently abandoned its Arctic exploration program for the time being at least. The drilling conditions are among the most challenging on Earth. But oil firms will still want to explore for further profits. And even if President Obama's ban proves hard to rescind, the next Secretary of State, Exxon's Rex Tillerson, may offer the industry a route round the ban through an Arctic drilling deal with Russia. Roger Harabin reporting. It's now nine minutes past seven. Syrian government forces are expected to take complete control of the city of Aleppo shortly. It follows the evacuation of thousands from those parts of the city that were held by rebels in the east. Well, Inji Sedki is a spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross and is in Damascus in Syria. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. What's the latest on the evacuations from the city? Are they still ongoing? Uh, yes, the evacuation is still ongoing. Uh, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent and the ICRC team are on the spot uh, helping with the evacuation. Uh, of course, it's taking a little bit much longer than we hoped and than we expected, but uh, we are doing uh, all we can. Are working uh, day and night in order to evacuate the civilians and the wounded as soon as possible. And can you give us some sense of numbers? How many have now been evacuated? And how many will you understand want to, to, to be taken out of the city? Uh, so far, we managed to evacuate uh, uh, more than 25,000 uh, uh, civilians and wounded. Uh, there are still more waiting. Uh, uh, I would say we don't have like the actual number, but I would say there are thousands uh, still to be evacuated uh, today and in the coming days. Maybe. And are there many people that you know who want to stay in the city and are happy, just happy to stay? Well, the civilians in Aleppo were given uh, the choice, either they leave or they stay. So yes, there are some people who chose to stay. Those who left are basically people who don't have anywhere else to go because they had their houses destroyed. They don't have uh, uh, much access to uh, medical care. So they needed to get the uh, uh, required treatment and uh, they feel they, they will be uh, safer uh, elsewhere. Of course, it's a very hard choice for the civilians because because you can imagine I mean people are, are leaving their uh, uh, homes behind their memories behind uh, some of them were leaving only with one suitcase with uh, some clothing going to uh, uh, an unknown and uh, uh, territory and starting uh, all over again in new life uh, but uh, uh, what we uh, is, uh, hope after this evacuation is over is to be able to reach out for the thousands who have been evacuated and to be able to provide the necessary humanitarian assistance and also to be able to reach the people who chose to stay in eastern Aleppo and assess their needs and provide the necessary. Uh, th of course, there were also evacuations at the same time as part of a deal from two towns in the province of Idlib, towns that were being besieged by rebel forces. Are, are those evacuations now complete? They are not complete yet. Uh, so far, uh, 750 uh, have been evacuated from uh, uh, the villages of Fua and Tifraya. Uh, the evacuation is still ongoing and uh, we do all we can in order to speed it up. And those that you have taken out, of whether, whether it's those towns or the eastern Aleppo, and who are now in Idlib, what condition are they in and what is it that they need? Basically, they need everything, shelter, uh, food, water, winter clothing. You know, now the temperature in, in uh, Syria is very, uh, very low temperature. It's very cold. Uh, uh, so far, then, uh, uh, the local authorities and some uh, charity organization, in addition to the branches of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, providing uh, the shelter, the food, the medical treatment. But we hope at a later stage to be able to access areas uh, as well and to assess their needs and provide uh, all the humanitarian uh, assistance that they will need.
Inji Sedki, thank you very much. The time is 13 minutes past seven. In these final days of his administration, President Obama has used a 1953 law to ban new offshore drilling for oil and gas in parts of the Arctic and the Atlantic. Donald Trump has said he would expand drilling, but this ban would safeguard a swathe of the Atlantic seaboard and much of the area off the coast of, the, of Alaska. Patrick Parento is Professor of Environmental Law at the University of Vermont. It's a bold move and a necessary move. If the United States is going to stay true to its commitments to the Paris Accord, it has to begin to phase down the development of oil and gas resources, and the President has taken a very important step to withdraw major portions of the Arctic Ocean within the United States and as well as the Atlantic coast from oil and gas development. So that will significantly reduce uh, our carbon and methane emissions. Is it something that President Trump would not be able to change? Well, that's an open question. The, 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 the authority of the president to withdraw these areas is clear, but whether that withdrawal can withstand a subsequent president's decision to reverse it is an open question. In the past, uh, President George W. Bush did reverse a decision by President Clinton. That was in a case where Clinton's withdrawal had a time limit to it, and Obama's uh, withdrawal doesn't have any time limit on it. So ultimately, a court is going to have to decide whether a subsequent president has the authority to reverse that. And it sounds as if it would be very difficult to do that. I think it would be difficult to do that. There's another law that we have it's called the Antiquities Act, which also gives the president the power to withdraw public lands and designate them as monuments or areas of special protection. So there's a history here to go back to the early 1900s of the president exercising authorities like this with respect to public lands. And uh, that has stood the test of time. So I think the Trump administration will be facing an uphill battle in order to try to overturn it. Were you surprised to see President Obama go to this length in, the, in these final days of his administration? Not really. He also put out uh, for protecting streams from coal mining in Appalachia, which is also quite controversial. And of course, this is on the heels of a number of rules that he's adopted to reduce carbon emissions from power plants and other sources. So the president announced in this second term that he was going to use his last uh, term in office to significantly move the United States forward in an attempt to both protect sensitive areas like the Arctic Oceans, but also reduce our carbon footprint. So the, uh, the action doesn't come as a big surprise to us in here in America. But it is a way to entrench uh, his environmental policy, safeguard his legacy in that area. Yes, it is. And, and it's uh, requiring the Trump administration to take some pretty dramatic action to try to reverse all of these different initiatives that uh, President Obama has taken. And at some point, he may, Trump may pay a political price for doing all this. The, the recent polling is showing that the American public still has strong support for environmental protection, for uh, measures to reduce carbon emissions and so forth. So um, President-elect Trump has announced a, a pretty broad-scale attack on all those kinds of environmental protections. And it'll, it remains to be seen whether the American public is going to go along with that. And would you expect uh, President Obama to make further legal moves in other areas to try and safeguard other policies which are important to him and which he fears uh, would be overturned? We do hear rumors that he may be using this power that I talked about, the Antiquities Act, to protect uh, other areas of public lands, particularly in the western United States. We haven't seen exactly what might be in store with that, but I, I suspect that we haven't seen the, the, the last of President Obama's initiatives in this area. Professor Patrick Parento, thank you very much. You're very welcome. The time is now 17 minutes past seven. Here's a question. What can we expect from house prices next year? And the answer, Dominic, is here. The answer is they will go up precisely 3%. <laughs> that's uh, at least the view of the World Institution of Child Affairs, which has just put out its forecast for the coming years. Uh, Simon Rubinson is the chief economist of the ICS. Simon, just tell us, what is this forecast based on? Well, the forecast is really based on the responses that we get from um, our professionals working across the country in the um, monthly housing market survey that we conduct. So um, we get the feedback from that survey, we do some additional analysis to try and draw out what the 
certainly the the sales market to buy a property it's been particularly challenging the prices have been moving much more rapidly upwards than wages have been growing and it's been making it increasingly difficult and it's only through a panoply of different government schemes that a lot of people have been able to get the deposit to get on the housing ladder so I think some comfort will be drawn by the fact that price growth is likely to be more modest ne next year nevertheless the indications that we're getting back from our members is that supply is still a major constraint in the market. That's all of the just about not enough new houses Well, I think it's a legacy of not enough new housing over certainly the last decade. And even though the latest figures on new supply are creeping upwards, which is testament to some of the policies that the the last government put in place. Um, it's still not really meeting the sort of numbers that people have in mind when we talk about household formation. It's also quite a low number of transactions in general, isn't it? The, the amount of stock in the estate agents bought is very low, isn't it? Absolutely. The second hand market is really dealt now by a lack of stock. So the legacy of that new build, and that is certainly filtering through into the amount of activity we're seeing. And I think for people working in the sector, a lot of the focus is often on the price movement, because that's eye-catching. But what really matters for the sector, and actually for the wider economy, is transactions, because it's transactions which generate spending across the economy. And as you say, rightly, the number of transactions that we've seen is still quite low by historic standards, and 2017 isn't likely to be an awful lot better on that front. Now, governments love to remember the council market, most people know why they make which is a stimulus more supply uh, in a few weeks' time. What kind of things do you think should be looking at? Well, we've had some pretty good steers as to what's likely to be in that white paper, and I have to say it's quite encouraging. The first, the first and most important point is that Theresa May's approach to the whole housing issue is much more holistic. There's much more of a focus on all tenants, so it's not just about owner occupation, it is about the private rented sector, it is about sub markets, renting and ownership. But we've also seen some, um, already some headlines about how the government is going to be in a position where it wants to provide more money for affordable housing. It wants to help remediate brownfield land so that is ready for development. And it wants to encourage the small and medium sized developers who have sort of been squeezed out of the market in recent years. When some of that white paper contains things like Simon Roots, Chief Economist at the LICS. Thanks very much, John. It's 21 minutes past seven. A judge ruled yesterday that Briggs's carers could stop giving him food and water. He is minimally conscious, and his wife had argued that he wouldn't have wanted to live like that. But although she won the case, she was immediately told that there may yet be an appeal by his state-appointed lawyers. Jackie Cowley acted as Paul Briggs' independent advocate, gathering information about his thoughts and feelings from his friends and family and colleagues. And she supported his wife, Lindsay, throughout the process. Uh, she's in Salford now. Good morning. Good morning. And how did she, Lindsay Briggs, react when she heard that this isn't the end of the legal process? Um, she was devastated um, when they first found out about the decision, the judge's decision, in terms of that he had come to a view that it was in Paul's best interest for treatment to be withdrawn. Family were incredibly relieved and, and felt that they could have a peaceful Christmas and begin the new year knowing that Paul's situation would end and that he would be let go um, because they feel that he lives uh, in pain and that he's suffering. Um, and so they were devastated knowing that at the moment that decision is on hold until there's further clarification. Now, he, do, do we know that he's in pain? He's minimally conscious, but I thought it was understood that people didn't know what that meant for the individual who was in that state. It's not known exactly in terms of the, the levels of pain that he might be experiencing, but certainly from the, the evidence that was given in court from medical experts, um, he does experience pain, um, but it, it isn't known the, the level of that and the duration of that, but yes, he does experience uh, pain and distress out of the nature of his injuries. Now, you have an interesting role here because, as I mentioned, it's uh, the lawyers who are appointed by the state for him who may challenge this outcome. But you are, uh, as I described, an independent advocate. You 
were brought in by his family to try to establish his missions. That's right, yes. And how did you do that? Um, it's essentially about spending time with, with Lindsay, with Paul's uh, family, his brothers, his mum, his wider families, but also speaking to his friends and colleagues, finding out who he was before the accident, um, what was important to him, how he lived his life, his values, his wishes, conversations that he'd had in the past around similar situations, uh, and what was important to him in terms of living um, and, and what was important in his life, and essentially representing that within meetings, within reports, within letters to the, the treating team, uh, to ensure essentially that at the centre of decision making. And, and this is, you were brought in because you've been involved with cases before where you end up present and you could present to the court your, effectively your feelings about what he wanted. Does this change, this ruling, this judgment yesterday, does it change the way that society views people in this condition? I think one of the key differences made is that this, this, this case wasn't focused on a diagnosis, on Paul's diagnosis, in the way similar cases have done in the court of protection. Um, and it very much focused on Paul's best interests in terms of what's important to him and what choices and decisions he would make if he could communicate that. And I think that, that, is, that is significant, that it was solely centred on that and not simply uh, a diagnosis, because a diagnosis isn't at the, the forefront of other decisions in the court for protection, unlike um, the, the category of, of disorders of consciousness. Um, and so in that sense, yes, it has made a difference and has ensured that a person's wishes and a person's voice uh, is at the heart of decision making and forms the basis for the court making a decision. Jackie Cowley, thank you very much. It's 25 past seven. Time for the sports news with Jackie. Yeah, good morning, Michelle and uh, Sarah. Uh, the former England cricket captain, Michael Vaughan, has urged Alistair Cook to step down from the role if the current captain has any doubts about his commitment. It follows the 4-0 series defeat in India. England don't play another test match until July. And Vaughan says Cook should be very honest with himself. He's got to uh, get a, have a, a real deal to think about it. He's got to kind of... Just ask himself in a mirror and just say, have I got the energy to take this team forward? The Ashes are in 12 months' time. If the answer is just a 1% no, well, he has to step aside. The two-time Wimbledon champion Petra Kvitova could find out later today how long she's likely to be sidelined for after severely injuring her playing hand during a knife attack at her home yesterday. In rugby union, Northampton are expecting their Wales wing, George North, to be cleared to return to action on Friday night against Sale. North has been stood down since suffering a head injury against Leicester earlier this month, and a concussion management review group is due to reveal their findings later. Our rugby union reporter Chris Jones joins us now. Chris, please give us some background to this case, if you want. Well, Jackie, it goes back to a match between Northampton and Leicester in the Premiership at the start of December. During the game, North took a heavy fall and appeared to lie motionless on the ground afterwards. North has a history of head injury, so naturally there was a great deal of concern for his well-being. But after being examined by the Northampton medical team, North was allowed to return to play on in the game to, to much surprise. So originally Northampton and their medics said they had reviewed the video footage and decided that North was OK to return to action. A few days later, they admitted that maybe they'd not seen all the right angles and that then threw up all kinds of questions. So a review group was established involving figures from Premiership Rugby, from the RFU and an independent chairman. They've been looking into this case for the last two and a half weeks, gathering all the evidence, speaking to everyone involved, and today this will uh, this should all be made public. Hmm, it does seem to have taken a little while for the review to be completed and published. Why do you think that is? Well, it's absolutely crucial it's done properly, Jackie, uh, and this needs to, to be done with total transparency. It's unprecedented, you know, unprecedented, you know it's, a, it's potentially a watershed moment for, for rugby in, in these parts because a lot has been said and done to improve concussion awareness, improve the management of concussion, to the point that, that what happened to North a few weeks back, being allowed to play on after taking such a fall, really shouldn't have been allowed to happen. So if there are parties at fault, and Northampton and themselves that have admitted in public that mistakes were probably made, then it can't just be brushed 
swept under the carpet. The authorities do have to take a strong stand with this. Ooh, well, that's a very important case. There's a, another interesting story, Chris, about the France national team. They've announced that they'll no longer select non-French players. I think you better explain that one to yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, this all goes back to, to the residency rule, which is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a rule that, that does stir up quite, quite a lot of, of consternation in, in the rugby world. Very topical because World Rugby, led by their vice chairman, Augustin Pichot, are reviewing the three-year residency period where a player can qualify for a country just because he's been living there uh, for three years. Many feel it should be extended to five or maybe more. Bernard de Port, the French president, seems to be going one step further now, and he's quoted as saying that they won't select anyone who is, quote, non-French. I mean, it opens up a bit of a can of worms because it's hard to, to categorise all players as one. You know, some may have moved over as a, as a, as a child and then had 10, 15 years in the, in the country. Do they count as French or non-French? So it does open a bit of a can of worms. Um, but a lot of countries, France, England included, have been regularly selecting players on residency recently. It's been harming some of the financially poorer nations, such as the Pacific Islands. So it would be a big statement by the French uh, if Laporte is true to his word. Okay, Chris Jones, thank you very much. Today's racing tips, the 135 at Ludlow, number seven, Colin's brother, and the five o'clock at Newcastle, number one, Natara. Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, now, John is here this morning. Or is he? Crossing live to Downing Street and a message from the Prime Minister. I have been accused of having no plan, and that chaos, friction, and acrimony is inevitable. But Christmas is always like that. I have been asked, will it be soft sprouts or hard sprouts? And I tell Philip I've left all that to David to Douglas and Ian Fox, so nothing can possibly go wrong. This year, let Christmas mean Christmas. The Dead Ringers 2016 Christmas Specials on BBC Radio 4 begin this Friday night at half past six. And the weather, there will be sunny spells today and rain for a time. You're listening to today on Radio 4 with Michelle Hussain and Sarah Montague. It's half past seven. Let's have a summary of the news from Chris Aldridge. Security has been tightened in Berlin as German police hunt the suspect behind a lorry attack which killed 12 people on Monday night. Officers who are following up 500 leads perpetrator may be armed. British police are reviewing security arrangements for public events over the festive period and have brought forward plans to close roads around Buckingham Palace during the changing of the guard ceremony. Syrian government forces are poised to take full control of Aleppo today following the evacuation of thousands of opposition fighters and civilians. The Syrian army has been using loudspeakers to urge the last rebels to depart before they move in. The CBI says UK firms will continue to need barrier-free access to European Union markets after Brexit. It's also calling for a migration system that allows firms to obtain the skills and labour they need. The organisation has carried out its largest consultation of members since the EU referendum. The healthcare regulator has published the failings it found at the abortion provider Murray Stopes International during inspection visits earlier this year. The Care Quality Commission said in one case a woman with learning difficulties had a pregnancy terminated even though she didn't understand what was going on. The company says it's made considerable changes since the inspections. The government's launching a consultation on new safety measures for drones, which means that anyone buying one in the future may have to register it and take a safety test. 59 near misses involving drones and airliners have been reported in the UK over the past year. MPs say the pension regulator should have the power to impose huge fines on employers who dodge their duties over staff pensions. The Working Pensions Committee describes the measure as a nuclear deterrent, which would reduce the danger of another BHS-type failure. An explosion at a popular fireworks market on the outskirts of Mexico City has killed at least 29 people and injured dozens more. Dramatic footage shows one stall catching fire, starting a chain reaction at last. Officials say a number of children were among those who've been badly injured. The time is now 28 minutes to 8. We still don't know who carried out the attack in Berlin on Monday night, nor why. It has been claimed by the Islamic State group, but the German authorities say that is only one of the leads being pursued. Chancellor Merkel has said that if the driver of the lorry turns out to be someone who sought asylum and protection in Germany, that would be particularly difficult to bear. Almost a million people entered Germany as refugees and migrants last year, many through the southern city of Munich. And our chief correspondent, Matthew Price, is there now. Matthew, good morning. Good morning, Michelle. From the railway station through which those hundreds of thousands of 
arrived last year and back then at the peak of that process there was a tent here on the forecourt outside the station in which the new arrivals were checked over. they were processed and looked at for any health issues before being sent onwards to other parts of the country a country that at that stage seemed eager to help and largely that was because the country's leader angela merkel had made it policy to help and policy to open the borders well as you indicated the german chancellor gave us a rare peek into her own mind yesterday with her statement following the berlin attack it would be particularly difficult for us all to bear she said if it turned out that the person who had committed this act was someone who had sought protection and asylum in germany difficult personally that is but also difficult politically the response generally from the mainstream politicians has been sober and measured and yet on the right and especially the far right her opponents are lining up the co-leader of the anti-immigration afd party which has been gaining in popularity said the milieu in which such acts can flourish has been negligently imported over the past year and a half well they closed the christmas markets in berlin but more than 2,000 stayed open across the country including the one here in munich well there's everything you'd want from a christmas market here hot mugs of glue vine a crepe stall fat being scraped off the hob where the breakfasts have been selling out and a huge christmas tree with hundreds of bright white lights all over it just in front of the neo-gothic facade of the the town hall here in munich monday night's attack in berlin doesn't seem to have put people off there are lots of them here but in amongst all the fun and the merriment there is also something else in the air it was a terrible moment just to see what's happened it's making me worried it's it's, it's christmas time what, what kind of people do this I, I don't understand i think it was just a matter of time and it's it will not be the last i think the country will change somehow we used to feel safe sort of safe and now people get more unsure where does that sense of fear take germany if anywhere what will ultimately the reaction be in this country already over the last year since angela merkel threw open the borders there has been a change politically there is greater control over who comes in and how long they are allowed to stay and yet politicians in places like this in bavaria are pushing for those controls to be tightened even further is that something that's going to happen is that something that germans want there are some in this country that are really waiting for something like this to happen as an argument to say no for refugees i have the, the slight feeling that in all of europe there's more and more nationalism is becoming bigger again and more important again and i think it's a it's a huge risk for our future do you think it will change policy maybe a little bit it's good to do to, to let the people in who needs help but i think you should look a little bit more who they come from what they did in the past not just say to one million people coming 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 come in and if you make this it's possible that you get problems you need more you need more control you think? a little bit that's exactly what the leader of the big regional conservative party here the csu said in the wake of the berlin attack he argued angela merkel should rethink germany's immigration and security policy and change it he knows his vote as well take a listen to this older couple and who are concerned about the cultural and religious differences currently being exposed in germany it's, it's a great problem and so we must discuss this have you discussed it enough in Germany yet? Obviously no. you don't think so. No. You're only beginning. A, that's right. Some parties on the left just close at the eyes about yes. problems in Bavaria. We have less problems. The politicians try to stop open borders. Well, there's a rooftop bar close to the main square where I'm meeting two of Germany's immigrants. The first is Ali Reza, who arrived here a year ago. And yes, he is concerned that the welcome Germany has shown him might change. 
when this kind of attacks happen, <laughs> I make with myself to see the reactions of Turkish people, bad reactions. I hear that my friend from refugees, I hear that they have problems when this kind of things happen. But Samar Kanani, a German citizen of Iranian descent who works with new arrivals, thinks there is still a willingness here to help. There's a lot of people who are volunteering for trying to help refugees get integrated into the job market. And I think there's so many people coming to our country who should really look at them as resources rather than uh, a problem. By late evening, as the temperature drops below zero and the market closes, the streets fall quiet. There's a calm that is a world away from the carnage of Monday and Berlin. We don't know how, but this will change Germany. Matthew Price reporting from Munich will be speaking to a former national security advisor to David Cameron after the 8 o'clock news. The time is now coming up to 20 minutes to 8. Let's take a look at the newspapers, and it is an image of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Merkel looking solemn and uncharacteristically vulnerable. She clutches a white rose in memory of the dead in Berlin that appears on the front of the Guardian. Hunt for truck attacker continues as far-right puts blame on Merkel, is the paper's headline. The Telegraph chooses the same image for its front page. The Sun believes the German people have been failed by their politicians, their intelligence services and their police, citing Mrs Merkel's immigration policy, which it says let in far more migrants than officials could vet. The Financial Times offers advice to the Chancellor, saying the attack calls for strength and calm. It says the German government would be unwise to respond by declaring a state of war or emergency, as that risks creating the expectation of a definitive victory that will never come. Equally unwise, the FT says, would be symbolic restrictions to liberty, such as a ban on burqas. Several papers focus on measures to protect the UK from terrorism. The Daily Mail's front page picture shows two armed police officers on guard with large assault rifles in Congress in front of a colourful nativity scene at Canterbury Cathedral. A small child in a Christmas hat stands nearby. The paper says the shocking contrast shows the scale of the threat facing Britain this Christmas. Taking a look at other stories, and the Telegraph says 4,000 soldiers are ready to drive replacement bus services during future strikes on Southern Rail. Local Conservative MPs have been lobbying for the government to provide buses and met Theresa May and the Transport Secretary Chris Grayling yesterday. The Daily Express, which also reports on the meeting, says the Prime Minister won't bow to pressure for emergency legislation to crack down on strikes. With a series of industrial disputes threatening disruption, the Sun urges her to follow in the footsteps of Margaret Thatcher and take on the unions to stop strikers inflicting misery on the unions. The Queen's decision to reduce her workload by giving up her role as patron of 25 organisations provokes much comment. The Daily Mirror welcomes the news that other members of the royal family will take over these duties, saying it's about time the younger royals started earning their money and pulling their weight. William, in particular, should start acting like an heir to the throne. And we don't want to see them cherry-picking sporting roles with free tickets. The Daily Mail says the Queen has set her subjects a peerless example of hard work and duty and says that some will ask if she is at last turning her thoughts towards some form of retirement. Shampoo sales apparently are going down the plug hole, according to the Times. It says the value of the market has plummeted by millions of pounds. Uh, analysts apparently, um, there are such things, believe people don't feel the need to wash their hair so often because of the ban on smoking, so hair doesn't smell, but also the trend for working from home. Hmm. Okay, less public exposure for the hair. The time is now at 22 minutes to 8. How do you get a break into the world of comedy writing? The David Nobbs Memorial Trust, established after the death of the Reggie Perrin author, has just launched a comedy writing competition aimed at recognising and encouraging a writer early on in their career. Here's David Nobbs himself talking about what it takes. I believe that comedy is more important in today's world than it has ever been. I worry about modern comedy seems to be getting cruder and cruder. Charm and subtlety are lost. The double entendre has been replaced by the single entendre. 